was on the bench. On the bench. First I was renting, now I'm collecting rent. Run it up. First it with the beamer, now I want the bands. Spending all the back, like here I go again. Here I go again. Outside says the chirp, now the camera phone. Told you I'ma make, keep the channels on. Why you acting different when the camera's on? Why you, Why you acting different like your paper long? Eight day wake up and I thank God. Bad decision got you wishing you could say nah. My city gritty, you could get hit any day now. Nah. On my mama, I'ma move, I finally wait out. Ah. With some twenties, fifties, hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions, zillions. I'm talking Amazon money, talking so much money I could mess around and buy Amazon. What's up guys? In this video, I'll be reviewing and comparing the most popular 95 square inch rackets out that you can still get your hands on right now. That would be the Wilson Pro Lab 6195 Hyper Pro Staff, the Head Pro Tour 2.0, the Head Prestige Pro G360 Plus, the Dunlop CX Tour 216x19, and the V Core 95 2018 and 2021 versions. This is going to be a long video, so if you need to use the timestamps, check them out on the screen and look at the description below. Recently, I've been having a lot of Achilles issues that has been very bad for the last couple of months. So my movement in these videos can be a little sus and most likely it's because I'm playing on one leg sometimes, but I did what I could for the review. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. For many of the rackets that I test, I pay with my own money, but sometimes it gets too expensive so I have to settle with a demo. Your support is much appreciated and a simple click of the like button goes a long way to help my channel grow so I can continue to make more videos. Also, I'd like to thank Ghost Sports for sending me their Axiom 9 pack tennis bag. I'm sure you've seen it around. I've been using it for the last five weeks myself. A tennis bag that's really well built, sturdy and functional. Holds four rackets in the holders, but another five in the main compartment if necessary. Plenty of storage space for accessories with a ventilated pocket for shoes or clothes. The main compartment can be divided into three sections with removable dividers, providing plenty of versatility for organizing your bag. Ghost Sports is a small company, so they can't produce mass quantity for a low cost but certainly quality is not something overlooked. I personally have used the RF DNA 12 racket bag over any other bag because of its protective shell but the bag itself is not great for organization since it's purely a racket bag so sometimes it can get messy and side compartments are small and limited. For tournaments I play in the future the go bag will be more functional and useful so if you're interested in getting one they also do a backpack and they do monthly giveaways if you sign up to their mailing list so follow them on instagram and check them out on the website below in the description so a 95 square inch racket may seem small for today's spin oriented and large head size dominated game of tennis however just counting off the top of my head the amount of players that still use a 95 square inch racket is almost about 20 percent of the current top 100 who have previously used or currently use a 95 square inch there are probably quite a few more that i don't know about but i'll list the few notable ones that i do on the screen so 95 square inch is definitely still a viable option in today's game if put in the right hands Taking a look at specs, obviously they all sport a 95 square inch size frame, but from beam thickness, the thickest to the smallest would be the 6.1 and the Prestige Pro at 22mm. The V Core 95 2021 changed from the 2018 version, but adding a little extra thickness at the top of the beam, so it went from 21, 21, 20 to 21.5, 22, 21, which probably should increase power and spin by a little bit. The CX Tour was at 20.5mm from top to bottom, and finally the Pro to a, at a thin 20 millimeters. The highest stiffness rating by far belongs to the 6.1 which was around 67 RA strong and the rest are relatively the same between 62 to 63 RA strong. The 6.1 and Pro Tour are tight 1820 patterns, the Prestige Pro and CX Tour are 1619, whilst the V Core comes in a unique 1620 pattern. And listed above are the average strong weight of the rackets, with the CX Tour and V Core coming in significantly lighter than every other frame in stock weight. And the final average swing weight shows that the 6.1 and the PT have the highest swing weight, with something over 330 on average, and the Prestige Pro is around the middle between mid to high 320s and the V-Core and CX are extremely low for a 95 square inch coming in at around the low 320s or even lower.
Let's start with the Wilson Pro Lab 6195. String setups, I put any modifications of strings or weight on the screen if I did use any. Just pause them for each racket if you want to have a look. For the feel and stiffness, the 6195 is by far the stiffest frame of the entire bunch. It has always been a stiff racket. With that being said, with the right choice of strings, the frame actually ends up being quite comfortable for its stiffness rating. Compared to other generations of the 6195, it's probably one of the most softest ones available. However, this does detract from other aspects that make it traditionally play so well, which I'll get into later. For maneuverability, a solid swing weight but at the same time not overdone in the low 330s. If you're used to heavier frames, it handles well enough as a high intermediate. With any extra added weight, you'll either need to be quite a strong advanced player or have an efficient stroke. Traditionally, this frame is not something you need to add much weight to. For power, it looks like one of the softer versions does have its downfall. Probably one of the lowest powered 6195s I've come across. In this case, it doesn't help to use thin strings like 18 gauge or 1.15 millimeters because that actually decreases the swing weight and drastically affects the plow through. So I wouldn't recommend reducing the swing weight at all. It's best to keep it around its natural 330 mark to maintain its optimal weight balance and swing weight. For spin, obviously if you want penetrating spin, this isn't the racket to go for. I find the launch angle you have to lift it up a little yourself, otherwise you can end up netting a lot of balls, especially the ones below the net. So if you like to play with round polos or hybrids, you need to make sure you generate that extra safety margin yourself. Penetration is the name of the game with this racket, but spin strings definitely do help a little bit, but you can lower your ability to penetrate the court slightly by compensating some safety margin for plow through. With the slice, as you would expect, it's pretty sweet, but it can be fairly difficult to time and be unforgiving if you're out of position. You need to put yourself in a good position on mostly every ball to win effectively with this frame. When you're in balance and in a good position, the slice is a stunner. Easily some of the best ones you'll hit with the least amount of effort. But in a defensive position, you can find it sometimes harder to carve through it just because of the demanding weight if you lack the strength like I do. For control, in the time that I've used the frame, control has been good but I expect it a little better. The weighting and stability allow you to redirect shots quite effortlessly, but many times when I was on the complete offense, I was spraying some ridiculously easy shots. It's actually due to the lack of power because you become more limited in the variety of swing speeds you can choose from. When you try to attack your opponents, you really have to swing very hard to produce an effective ball and anything in between generates a much weaker ball that any good offensive player would immediately be able to attack and take advantage of. The caveat is even though you can penetrate the court with bigger swings you need to play much riskier tennis as a result which then means you are prioritizing power over accuracy. Swinging hard with the lower spin potential from an 1820 means that it will be more difficult to generate effective angles with more touch. Rather you require a continuation of aggressive swings which can be both very tiring and pretty low percentage tennis. With serves, my old Encode 6195 is possibly the best serving racket I've ever used and still to this day it's hard to beat. I was hoping to find something similar with this version and while still decent, it didn't hit home quite like my Encode did. But the serve accuracy is still solid, I can generate good slice serves, even decent kick serves with good height. But due to the lack of comparable power to the old generations, I felt it to be good at best. But definitely not something that stood out to me like the previous versions. For stability, easily one of its brightest spots, no shake or twisting, very solid, both ground strikes and more so at the net. If you have a nice feeling string setup, the combination of stability and feel is definitely what the racket does best. For forgiveness, being a dense pattern and smaller head size, it obviously is not going to be very forgiving, but adding to the small sweet spot with the low power meant that you would really have to swing quite hard on every ball to maintain good depth and pace. If you don't provide a full swing against a good player, you can easily get taken advantage of with the lack of pace, so you really have to be the first to the ball and attack at every opportunity that presents itself. On the volleys, a good headlight balance point with the stability that I mentioned really lends itself to a very solid volleying racket. It requires almost no effort from you at all and you can redirect or block some heavy shots with relative ease. If you are versing someone that is a higher caliber player who outpaces you, takes time away from you, this is certainly not the kind of racket that you want to be stuck with. When you verse better players, you want to make tennis more efficient and as easy as possible, not harder. So I can't say I would recommend this to anyone who's not a fanatic of the original frame. It's more if you want one of the coolest looking paint jobs around in my opinion. You'll have to pay a premium price for it though, but it's a very nice collectible for those who are willing to spend the money for that kind of thing.
Moving on to the Pro Tour 2.0. For feel, undoubtedly the PT 2.0 is the best feeling frame of these choices by far. I don't believe in the hype around the high stiffness rating compared to the original or pro stock versions. It still feels fantastic and personally I don't think it is significantly any worse than the original. It really comes down to your personal tastes. It's different but that doesn't mean it's bad. Any string combination I use seem to only affect the variations of ball pocketing and spin potential. Variations in tension is what mattered the most as I'm accustomed to larger sweet spots with more ball pocketing these days. Stringing extremely low works very well for me to increase the forgiveness and power. So don't be afraid to experiment with very low tensions for these more unforgiving rackets. You'll be at surprise how good the racket plays and the ball feels whilst maintaining control. Going to something extreme like 35 to 38 pounds still allows you to get plenty of control if you use polo strings but significantly increases the sweet spot to where it's much easier to use. But if I string at my normal 45 to 48 pounds I feel the sweet spot is very direct and towards only the center of the frame and the rest of the racket can feel quite jarring. You get a great connection to the ball, it's a solid type of flex, not something that bends too much like the clash, and the frame holds stable while the strings pocket the ball. And it doesn't hold onto the ball for too long either so it doesn't feel like there's a major delay in a strip. For maneuverability, due to the higher weight, the first thing that I did was use a lighter replacement grip because adding an overgrip and dampener is an extra 7 grams. So I put a Babolat Syntec Team, Wilson Feather Thin or a Kimani Leather Grip which removes about 7 to 8 grams from the handle. So when I add the overgrip and dampener, it's almost like playing at completely stock with extra accessories. However, it does thin out the grip, so if you do prefer the more defined feel of grip but don't like leather, these are good options to choose from. The second thing I always do for a dense pattern and heavy frames are to use 18 gauge strings. This reduces static weight another 4 grams and swing weight will also go down maybe 3 or 4 points. This allows me to maintain a weight that I can handle whilst providing extra spin potential and power. Note that I also tried these changes on the ProLab 6.1 and it didn't turn out positively. Unlike the 6195, for the Pro Tour, the power was definitely not an issue. If you can swing properly with this racket, you can totally obliterate balls. My experiences with the PT is nothing but positive. A blessing for any flat hitter that wants a mix of power and precision combined with a heavy but maneuverable frame. For spin, using thin strings helped a lot with extra spin potential and launch angle. But if you stick to your usual round polys and hybrids, just expect what you typically would get from playing with a frame that's more traditional in sorts in terms of launch angle and spin potential, being more straight shot, flatter trajectory and penetrating skitters. There is definitely solid spin capabilities with this racket, just not anything crazy and advantageous. Slice is certainly one of its best shots in its arsenal. Any solid contact will lead to an effective slice. If you're keen on using a more calculated offensive slice like Ash Barty, this frame will definitely give you some of the best slices you'll ever hit, really knifing through the air. For control, the directional control of the PT 2.0 is everything you could want. Whereas the Pro Labs failed me on the offense, I feel like the PT has both qualities you want on both offense and defense. Exceptional directional control and stability when it comes to blocking big shots and guiding balls back into play, but the addition of pinpoint accuracy when you load up for big winners. The reason why the encode worked so well for me back in the day was because of its point and shoot ability. However, as I've evolved as a player, as I mentioned, I began to favor more feel over the stiffness, and that's the reason why the PT 2.0 stands out for me because it has that point and shoot ability from a stiffer racket with the excellent feel with the perfect amount of ball popping and soft flex is what makes it a joy to use. From testing all frames, a 95 square inch frame is my favorite size for serving overall. The PT 2.0 provides plenty of good quality characteristics to help a high level serve. Thin beam for aerodynamics, power and penetration through the heft of weight, and extra accuracy with a smaller head size and tight string pad. As with most rackets, I feel quite comfortable kick serving regardless of what frame I use. I can still provide just as much height and kick as I do with most of my other rackets, but a slight variation of the amount of spin that can only be notice if you pay really close attention. For stability the PT is comparable to both the 6195, RF97 and Blade Pro. They all have that rock solid steady feel. It's definitely some of the most enjoyable aspects of these frames because once you get used to them it's very difficult to go back to something lighter as they begin to feel like plastic toys in comparison. For forgiveness I found stringing at my normal tensions between 45 to 50 pounds didn't work very well for me. Basically made the frame extremely difficult to use and the sweet spot very small compared to the likes of my gravity obviously which has an extremely large sweet spot. So I found string between 36 to 42 pounds to be very advantageous to help with today's style of play. At my regular tension the sweet spot was the size of a P 
be a little more harsh and hidden off center but with extremely low tensions the sweet spot drastically opens up making me confident enough to play with this for even some of my current matches. For volleys there's not much to say it's similar to the Pro Lab 6-1 stick your racket out to where you need to and let it do the work for you. Very fun to play with in all areas of the court and has great touch and feel on drop volleys and has extreme stability on blocks. If you're skeptical about using this frame because of its high weight and high swing weight but you know that you have the capability of using such a frame I would definitely recommend trying out variations and experimenting with your strings, weight and tensions. This definitely could open up a whole new realm and you'll realize some of those rackets you thought you couldn't play with you would end up loving and playing fantastic with it. Moving on to the Prestige Pro. After using many iterations of the latest lineups in head frames with their 360 Plus models, I'm not surprised that this racket feels quite nice. Both solid and decent amount of flex and softness. It's not as perfect as the PT but it's still very comfortable. But like many of the other G360 Plus lineups though, I think stringing at a higher tension with poly will bring out a certain level of unwanted stiffness. Trying out RPM Blast made it a little too firm for my taste but using poly to a fire worked really well and it was quite nice and much more enjoyable to use. For of maneuverability both the weight and average swing weight lie around my optimal range so I felt fairly comfortable with it straight from the bat. Because it's not too high you can get away with a little bit more of a head heavy balance but definitely is more user friendly than the other two rackets. This produces a relatively good amount of power being 15 grams lighter than the Wilson and more flexible. I'd have to put it down to the increased swing speed, a more open string pattern, power was accessible if you needed it and probably because of the smaller head size you could still flatten out balls with relative ease. For spin you have some space to work with with spin on the Prestige Pro. You can vary your shots between a good amount of top spin and also some high paced flat shots. So I think the frame has some versatility more than the other two. The launch angle was just about in my perfect range clearing the net with relative ease without overheating it past the baseline too often. Slice potential is not as good as the PT but because of the increased maneuverability it makes life a lot easier to get around more forgiving to play with so you don't have to be as perfect so you can get away with more balls but slice on an open pattern will never quite match a nice tight 1820. For control I enjoyed the amount of control the combination of weight and spin it gives you very consistent depth control if you maintain a good rhythm and swing. Having a 1619 pattern in a 95 starts to really modernize the racket a little bit more and makes it much easier easier to stay on top of an attacking game style so you'll be rewarded more with precision as long as you can stay on top of the ball. For serves, out of all the rackets I tested I would say this is probably the best serving racket. The lower more compatible weighting gives me the ability to swing out harder but there is enough weight that will still go straight through the ball and give you enough plow through. The smaller head size maintains accuracy despite the open pattern but what the open pattern does is that it gives just a little bit more spin on both the kick and slice serves. With stability, the stability is probably the area that needs the most work on the racket. It's fairly normal for a 95 square inch racket to require more weight to stabilize it. Personally I could probably get away with the stock swing weight if you focus on good timing. There are only certain heavy shots that will expose it like a huge serve but to sacrifice my swing speed and maneuverability for extra stability is not something that I like to do if I think I can manage it myself. For forgiveness, because of the open pattern I think it helps a lot. You can get away with a lot more balls on the defensive side in comparison to the PT and the Wilson 95. Because there's a little more free spin and power you don't have to compensate as much for the unforgiving aspects of the other models. I also didn't find the sweet spot to be too small. It was a fairly comfortable range so just having a more open pattern on a smaller frame seems to really help as I found out with the V-Core 95 as well. For volleys they were a bit on and off for me. Well struck and timed volleys felt pretty solid. Solid. However, just like the ground strokes, there was an inkling of feeling that instability with a little bit of shake and twisting with some off center shots. Like I said, definitely nothing a little extra weight cannot fix, but not terrible in any way. If the Prestige MP wasn't made, this is definitely still a quality racket to choose from. But in Australia, its pricing is ridiculous and I wouldn't spend the 310 US dollar price tag on it. And I think you're better off spending that on a Dunlop CX Tour or a V Core instead. Moving on to the Dunlop CX Tour 216 by 19. In stock specs, the CX comes in an extremely light package. The swing weight is about 315 and it's also very head light for only a 326 gram strong spec. 
Coupled with a thin beam and relatively low stiffness rating for today's retail rackets, you would wonder why anyone would want to choose this at all. But the kind of market this racket is targeting is for people who know exactly what they're looking for. When you list out the specs on paper, it's pretty typical to know what to expect from the CX Tour. And so the CX Tour is really made in a similar fashion to the Ultra Pro. For high intermediate to advanced players that understand their preferred spec range and are willing to modify to exactly how they want it. I'm a bit in between as I usually prefer not touching a racket's specs unless it's absolutely necessary and if I do I try to make only minor adjustments to keep it lighter and fast but what's most important is that despite being heavily underweighted for a 95 square inch when you play with it it has a good base of how it plays and that's basically the story of the CX Tour so for the feel and stiffness so far for the CX Tour the one I tried was in stock and strung with Vocal Cyclone 16L at 48 pounds with Cyclone being a sharp and shaped string being a low to medium firmness there was a good amount of ball pocketing no jarring as such, the strings made the racket extremely crisp and I was able to get away with playing on a damp night with wet balls. But I think an even softer poly would make it really nice to play with, like Hyper G Soft or Vocal V Square or a good hybrid. However with the lack of weight you can feel a bit of the hollowness through the racket so you definitely need a decent amount of weight in the head to fix it up. For maneuverability, it's obviously really fast through the air, extremely whippy and you can maneuver it very easily, manipulating the head of the frame in any way you need to around the ball. I like that it's headlight to begin with at its low weight so that you have a lot more room to play with and even when you add a whole bunch of weight to the head you can still maintain a very headlight balance at around 32 centimeters or 6 to 7 points headlight. Power is a tough one to gauge just because you know that it's incredibly light but there are instances where if you swing at full speed you can still generate a powerful shot but without any modifications the amount of power required to replicate that over and over would be fairly unrealistic. So for power it needs to be at least 325 to 330 in swing weight before you can accurately gauge it. But the base feels solid enough and the racket head speed is extremely fast with the string pattern quite open as well. So they are all key foundations to giving you a good enough base for or a source of power but in stock obviously not great in comparison to the other frames. With spin there's plenty of spin you can generate and pairing it with Cyclone provided a ton of height. In terms of launch angle it's very high for a 95 and you should have no trouble clearing the net but because of the lack of weight providing the extra momentum through the ball if you don't swing it's probably going to drop pretty short so just keep that in mind. Slice is pretty decent you have to knuckle in and rip it because of the low weight but with the spin strings and being a 95 made it very easy to come behind the ball and really cut through. You can get some really nice action behind it but since it's fairly open taking your foot off the gas pedal it can float a lot more than the other rackets. Control is relatively good, you can find really good angles, consistent depth on full swings and you can impart enough spin on the ball to bring it back down on high spinning shots. And though you'll never be able to replicate the pinpoint accuracy of an 1820, keeping a 95 low powered with spin capabilities is a really good combination in my book and you'll absolutely find this combo works for the V-Core 95 as well. For serving I didn't feel as dialed in as any of the other rackets for accuracy but it definitely provides you enough spin capabilities. No no doubt due to the low weight but if I really loaded up my body and threw in a big swing it was still capable of producing fairly good pace. Overall I'd say at least in stock form probably the weakest serving racket by far and it's definitely in need of modification but with the right changes it could actually be a hidden gem. As for stability you can imagine that it's pretty flimsy at only a swing weight of 315 but even I found that it's not as terrible as I first thought it might be before trying it. Given that I personally think that you wouldn't have to add a ton of weight to make it play pretty stable which would definitely be up my alley for specs. In terms of forgiveness I like advocating for an open pattern on a 95 because it works really well. For racket enthusiasts and high level players it just gives you the best of both worlds between modern and classic. The CX is fairly forgiving as a 95 and if you were to choose any of these rackets to play with in today's game as a smaller head size this is definitely on top of the echelon in terms of potential. The cons for volleys really just revolve around the lack of solid weight, but the pros are that it's very easy to move around, thin frame, pretty forgiving, and the touch and feel are all there in the racket. Again, nothing a little customization wouldn't be able to assist with. The clear theme here is that the CX was made to be customized, 
and without it, it's probably something that you should stay away from if you don't like modifying rackets. Once you've customized the CX Tour, there's no doubt in my mind that it will probably be in the first two choices for rackets to pick amongst this list if I had to switch to any of these five in the review. As much as I love the other frames for their classical characteristics, if I'm playing in a proper tournament or competition, there's just no extra benefits for me to choose the other three frames instead. Here you're basically looking at a 95 square inch Ultra Pro and I would even argue probably slightly softer, even a little bit more forgiving and at a customized weight probably more power as well. Finally we have the V-Core 95. And I'm just going to be straight up and say that this is, my opinion, the best racket on the list by far. I've been using this frame for at least two months next to my Gravity and another racket, and this has been my go-to racket for overall reliability and enjoyability since I picked it up. Now which generation of the V-Core 95 am I talking about exactly? I'll be upfront and say that although the two play very similar in many ways with subtle differences, the biggest difference and what my choice comes down to primarily is the feel. So for the feel and stiffness between the 2018 and 2021 versions, I know that there is basically a crowd that likes either or. People like that the 2021 version is a little bit lower in stiffness and feels a little bit more dampened, but in my personal opinion, I'm not that big of a fan. I think that they've muted the racket too much, and although it's not quite as muted as something like the Countervail technology from Wilson, it definitely has headed into that direction a lot more than I like. The stiffness of the V-Core 95 2018 is similar to the ProStaff 97 V13, which is that yes, it is on the firmer side, but if you put a softer setup in, you get a really good combination of stiffness and ball pocketing. And even for someone with a sensitive wrist like me, I can still handle it just fine and it's very enjoyable to use. Not to say that the 2021 version is terrible by any means, but since I think there is a better option out there, I would go for the 2018 version 10 out of 10 times. Not to mention, this is still probably the perfect time around to buy them if they're still around because they're going to be a lot cheaper than the newer one. Also, quality control for Yonex has been a little bit more suspicious this time around. I've seen at least three or four of the 2020 versions with a swing weight of under 310, with the one I tried being at 307, which is pretty terrible for Yonex's notorious standards. It goes to show that even the specs are relatively good with static weight and balance, the swing weight is the more important number. And by the way, these clips of me playing are generally on the early play test of the frames, but I've now been playing with it for two months in, I have become so dialed in now that I play some of my best tennis with them. So aside from feel, many aspects of the V-Core 95s from both iteration play pretty similarly. What I do like is that they are a 95 at 310 grams unstrung, but they start out in stock form with a lot of weight in the handle, so they're extremely fast through the air, the beam is not thick at all, and with the addition of even a little bit of weight to the head, it still remains extremely headlight and whippy, which personally it suits me perfectly. The CX Tour and the V-Core are obviously the most friendly when it comes to one-handers and the amount of control of the racket head and speed I generate is everything you need for your one-handed backhand. In fact, since starting with this racket, it has helped my backhand become much more technically efficient, sound, smoother and I would argue for the first time in my life, my backhand is more reliable than my forehand in full speed play at the moment. It's really insane since up until two years ago, it was one of my biggest weaknesses and I wouldn't even want to hit top spin on it. Power wise, if you're really not accustomed to ever trying one of these frames from this comparison review, you're going to quickly find out how difficult it will be to generate power from these rackets. Even when I first picked them up, the swing weights were between 307 to 317, and without having adjusted yet to the frame and trying to swing like normal, you'll we'll find that there is seemingly almost no power from this racket at all. But once the tension really started to loosen up and my swing and muscle memory adjusted to the weighting, there is actually still plenty of power to be generated. Even with a low swing weight of 317, you can blast some huge shots. So my personal recommendation is that if you string in the high 40s to low 50s, I would bump it down maybe 5 to 8 pounds because the V-Core 95 starts to open up when you loosen up the tension and also you begin to get a really nice plush feeling with the added extra power that you'll probably be missing from your normal tension range. But what's even better is that because it's just typically much lower power than most other rackets that I've been using, if I go all out on a swing, my percentages have increased significantly because the racket has tamed my max speeds but even though they may be 10 to 15 percent slower than my max the fact that i can swing and make them more often is what makes this racket even more deadly to use 
The extra change in a slightly thicker beam for the 2021 version will no doubt produce some percentage increases in power if you're talking about the same specs or swing weight. But from my experiences with the 2018 model, I don't think there needs to be any change at all. It is actually the perfect amount and can always be adjusted by weight. My final spec is only 324 swing weight at this point with just 2 grams at 10 and 12. In the spin department, I know that this depends on your preference and whether you like to use poly or not, but if you think spin generation is a problem with the V-Core 95, you're definitely using the wrong string. Pair it with any super spin friendly string, and for a control racket, this thing produces some of the best controlled spin potential that I've played with. On my top spin forehand shots, I can get the ball to consistently clear the net by a large margin and have it dip back down in the court with plenty of space between the lines, making it both safe and deadly at the same time with good consistent depth. The launch angle with a spin string is perfect for my targeting range as I'm always aiming for a deep baseline and because of that spin potential I can still make it a safe shot to play. Slice I would have to say is not as good as the rest of the rackets, not to say it's bad at all but since it's a comparison review it's just not as remarkably easy as some of the other frames. But there is definitely a lot of potential to it but I can't say that it wows me any more than any other racket that I've used. It hits a decent one and it does the job and I don't have any complaints about it in general. For control, the reason I love the V-Core is because of the layers of control that you have access from. The first is from the low powered nature that allows you to swing 100% on power shots yet still be able to manage the risk level of the shot. It won't just spray on you like any other power frame might sometimes. It's incredibly consistent off the string bed I feel and gives you the ultimate confidence. The second layer is spin generation which plays into safety margin and consistency. This reminds me of playing with low powered rackets like the Ultra Pro and the Wilson Pro Stuff 97 V13. These three rackets are the most consistent I've ever been able to play with any frame. It's given me confidence and taught me better shot selection because I know that I'll be able to make the balls more often. The icing on the cake is that not only can I generate more power than both rackets, but I can do it in a package that's 10 grams lighter and I can also flatten out balls more easily, but also generate even more topspin than those as well. The last layer is defensive control, a result of its headlight balance and low static weight. When the frame has to be further away from your body, which usually means you lose more control and have to generate more speed with your arm and wrist, because it's light and whippy, you can get around the ball much easier on the stretch. and That allows you to play better angles on the run or just gives you a better chance to get back into the point from defensive positions. On the serve, the flat serve is what probably loses out the most from the lack of weight and swing weight. Though you can still produce some pretty decent flat serves, you can feel a little bit of the twisting happen when you want to generate some really good pace. If you add more weight and increase the plow through, the potential for the serves could be very high. Something that I might try to experiment with later on. But the accuracy is all there. Even for an open pattern, I can hit a lot of my spots very well with this racket. And that extra bit of plow through could take it to a whole nother level. But whether or not that detracts from my ground strikes is something yet to be seen for me. But overall, I have some extreme level of confidence to play out my second serves with full swings, kick serves or slice serves. My slider out wide hits their mark at least 80% of the time on the first or second serves when they're in. And on kick serves with spin strings, I've been able to get some really crazy jumps on some of my kickers. It's definitely one of the most versatile control oriented serving rackets that I've come across. The power and spin may not be better than any other racket, but its overall package of versatility is what makes it really, really effective to play with. As I mentioned, with stability is a give or take with these frames. They normally have to be quite heavy for a 95 to play half decent, so we're talking around the 345 to 355 grams at least. My V-Core 95 currently is around 332 grams. And there are instances where I can feel the lack of stability, but it's not such a glaring weakness that I'm running to add weight. I've been playing with it at 324 swing weight for a while now, and if I just focus on good timing with contact with the ball in front of me, I really don't notice it too bad. And even against very heavy hitters, I actually like to keep my swing speed higher to get my full swing around the ball instead of shortening my swing with extra weight to play out the stability. And with the stability comes the forgiveness. The isometric head shape and the open 1620 pattern has made this the most forgiving 95 you'll ever set your hands on. So much so that it pretty much is what you would expect from an Ultra Pro 16x19 to play like, except that the sweet spot is still even more forgiving than that racket as well. 
Coming from the Gravity Pro, which is basically like playing with an oversized racket, I generally don't feel a significant disadvantage to the head size or sweet spot, but I'll preface that by saying I still don't think that I would play better with the v 95 than my Gravity Pro against my toughest opponents, but on a day-to-day -day basis considering the weight, swing weight and control, the v Core is more enjoyable to play with every day, whereas the Gravity Pro serves me when I want to play at near my peak level. Finally, volleys is probably the only key category that you really notice the lack of weight, but there is plenty of touch and feel for you to get by, and increasing it to a swing weight of around 330 would probably do wonders for you if you're a keen volleyer. At this stage, I prefer to keep it as fast as possible, so it's not quite a consideration yet, but the more I use it, the more I'll zone in on exactly what I need. All in all, the v 95 potentially is the most versatile advanced racket that I've ever used. Ultimate control, great spin potential in a lightweight package, and a 95 square inch for precision but open sweet spot for modern day play. If you want a more dampened feel and perhaps a slightly softer racket, maybe go with the 2021 version. I don't actually think you could go wrong with either version, but if you like a little bit more feel, stick with the 2018 one, especially considering the price. Just keep in mind that all the rackets in this video are considered high intermediate to advanced rackets. So I wouldn't recommend any of them to you if you're someone who struggles to maximize the output of frames from the likes of a Blade, Extreme Tour or Radical MP. 95s are certainly prevalent in today's game, especially for professional ATP players. But unless you want to pick up the CX Tour with an open pattern or a V Core 95, you might find some trouble playing in the more modernized game of power, spin and forgiveness. Unless these rackets really accentuate your style of play or you have all the skills and technique to maximize their capabilities. These are all very special rackets for their own reasons. And personally, I think there are a good amount of rackets on the retail market at the moment and you really cannot go wrong. I think we are sport for choice at the moment compared to a few years ago. But anyway, I've done enough talking. If you've enjoyed the video, again, please like the video and subscribe if you haven't already. Share it with the people who are interested in these rackets. These videos really do take me more than 30, 40 hours of playtime and editing myself. So any support is really appreciated. If you stuck around to the end, check out the ratings of each racket that I've provided at the end of the video. And on that note, I'll see you guys next time.